Ah, yes, thank you very much. Uh, and again, good morning. Uh, my name is Dick Oepkes from uh, Leiden, the Netherlands, which is uh, here. You are here, so you know where the Netherlands is. That's good. Uh, the Leiden University Medical Center is uh, just 25 kilometers south from here, in the middle of the Bulbfield uh, area. It's a little bit early of, in the time of the year to uh, actually visit the bulb fields. Uh, 22nd of March it opens up, but I wouldn't go there that early. Uh, April, May would be, uh, would be great to visit uh, our area f if you're interested in tulip bulbs. Um, this is the hospital next to the train station, conveniently located. And this is what the hospital looks like when you're lying on the ground somewhere in the back. I, I didn't even recognize it when I first saw the picture, but uh, this is where we actually are with our uh, Department of Obstetrics. And uh, the Department of Obstetrics in Leiden has been for the past 45 years uh, the National Center for Invasive Fetal therapy in the Netherlands. We're very happy that we uh, have been able to concentrate that care in one center, meaning that we have uh, reasonable numbers and experience with uh, our group. This was started by uh, Jack Bennebroek Gravenhorst, uh, who has retired a couple of years ago. Uh, he went to New Zealand in 1964 to learn intrauterine transfusions, and when he came back, he started our center. And then the next uh, head of the center was Humphrey Kanhai, and I'm sort of following in their uh, footsteps. I have no conflicts of interest to declare, and uh, I hope that in uh, about 20 minutes uh, you will all know uh, which fetus is a definite candidate for thoracoamniotic shunting, and that you understand how this procedure is actually done. The shunt procedure was first invented for uh, lower urinary tract obstruction. This was a diagnosis that was really easy uh, to make even with the, the very first ultrasound machines in, in the late 60s, early 70s. This large black hole, no amniotic fluid, there was a clear abnormality that could be detected and of course uh, almost always uh, lethal. So. The pioneers of fetal therapy uh, thought, well, this can be fixed by inserting a shunt, bypassing the blocked uh, urethra, and providing the fetus again with amniotic fluid so it could develop the lungs and it could survive. And the concept was, was quite, uh, quite clear. And the, the shunt developed uh, both in England and in the United States were similar uh, in, in terms of design where it was inserted with a needle and then uh, this, this double pigtail shunt, as it uh, was called and still is called, has a memory of, of this, this curve. So when you push it through the needle, it, the curve comes back and then you take the needle back and push in the second half and then these two curves keep it in place. Uh, it's quite amazing that this shunt was developed early in 1980s and has not been improved at all. We use exactly the same shunt today in most fetal therapy centers, which means that either the design was brilliant and couldn't be improved, or we are all too lazy to make a better one. These are the first publications of shunting of fetal hydrothorax, showing that it is an, an old technique. We have quite a lot of experience um, and uh, Alistair Roberts from New Zealand actually inserted a, a catheter that uh, was inserted in the fetal thorax and the, went outside to the, to the skin of the mother to drain not in the amniotic fluid but outside in a, in a sterile pocket. That was soon uh, abandoned with, with uh, too high risks of ruptured membranes and infection, and most series now are done with the so-called Rodex shunt. This is the device. This is this double pigtail silic silicone. It's 2.2 millimeters on the outside, 
and it is pushed in by, this is the original uh, show car that Rodek developed with a side channel to uh, take out some fluid or, or insert some fluid uh, in case of the urinary tract obstruction. And there, he had two pushers, a uh, long one to push it into the fetus and a short one to push the second part in the amniotic fluid. And nowadays we use a, a modified inserting uh, device. It's a cook uh, needle with a, a very sharp tip trocar uh, only uh, replaced by a, a pushing rod which has a marker halfway so you can see how far uh, your trocar goes in to push in the first and the second half. And this is Greg Ryan. I was a fellow with him um, a long time ago. And he taught me how to do this procedure. I think he has the, the largest uh, number of procedures done in the world and basically is, is still using uh, the same technique as Rodek invented in the early 80s. We use only local uh, anesthesia for the mother. This is a three millimeter uh, a, a needle. And it is not particularly painful. Uh, we used to do these procedures even under general anesthesia or uh, combined spinal epidural in the first few years, but it's really not necessary to use anything more than local. And the fetus, uh, there's always discussion on, on pain in the fetus. Can you measure it? Is it important? Should you avoid it? Should you give drugs? Um, after 26 weeks, we now use a, a combination of fentanyl and uh, atracurium, which is like pancuronium, it's a it's muscle relaxant, and some atropine, which is a sort of a standard cocktail for uh, fetal interventions that, uh, for instance, Jan de Prest uses a lot as well. And this works very well. Whether it's necessary, nobody knows. A recent guideline from the UK says that fetuses do not feel pain until birth, which is kind of surprising, but... Uh, these guidelines from the UK are usually very well evidence-based. So, This is what the procedure looks like, uh, local anesthesia. We uh, have a sterile uh, OR type environment and uh, this is a, a cartoon of how it works. The needle goes into the fetus, into the, uh, the fluid in the thorax. Usually there's a very thick skin because they're all hydropic. That's we we'll come back to that in a second. Then the pushing rod push, pushes in the first circle. You can see that on ultrasound. Then you take the rod back outside the fetus and push in the second part. Sounds relatively simple. Um, of course, there are structures that you don't want to puncture with your needle. And it's not always easy to go between the ribs in these very small fetuses. It's quite a thick trocar for a small fetus. This is a cartoon from Leuven. Actually, what we try to do is insert it uh, from the back, just below uh, uh, the scapula here, to prevent the fetus from pulling it out. It's one of the problems with the, the Luto shunt. These uh, children with uh, urinary tract obstruction, they, uh, they're all boys and they're playing around with their hands like this and they, they pull out these shunts when you insert it here. So for the th uh, hydrothorax, we push it into the, into the back. Usually, at least the majority of cases are bilateral. So we put one in here and we put one in here and the fetus cannot reach it. This is a, a, just a model to illustrate how it works. Um, this is what we used for a, a simulator uh, a procedure. This is how you push the needle into the cavity. This resembles more the bladder than the hydrothorax, but the principle is the same. So then the first curve comes out. Then you push in the second uh, curve uh, outside the fetus. And then, uh, like this picture, this is a color doppler flow of fluid coming out from the thorax through the shunt. It's extremely high pressures. When you put in this trocar, uh, or the needle, and you take out the trocar, the, the spray of fluid can go up, up to the ceiling. If you don't put your hand on it, 
quickly, it, it's really very high pressures. And you like to have some fluid still in there so you can actually unfold your, your catheter. And it, it often soon uh, disappears, the fluid, when you take out. So this is the, the sort of standard uh, indication uh, case, bilateral hydrothorax. You see the very thick skin of the, of the hydrops. And often images like this uh, cause a lot of anxiety in the referring doctors and patients, of course, to say, well, this is, this is hopeless. This is a baby that's going to die for sure. And, you know, this shunting is dangerous and it's probably not working well. Uh, it's not enough evidence. So I'm still convinced that, that even despite a lot of publications and guidelines, Cases like this are, are terminated or are uh, left to nature to die because it looks uh, terrible. It does. Uh, but the good thing is that it can recover if it is a truly isolated hydrothorax case. The prognosis is actually not too bad at all. And this is the procedure. Uh, you see the needle coming in through the skin, amniotic fluid and into the uh, one side of the, of the thorax here. You see it's quite close to the heart, so that is one of the tricks to stop pushing uh, before you actually uh, touch something vital. Then it's quite difficult to keep all the fluid in there. There's some leakage, there's a lot of pressure. Then the, the curve unfolds into the fetus, then pulling back the needle to outside the fetus here it's important to pull it back far enough so you don't push the whole uh, uh, shunt inside. It's also important not to pull back too much because then the, the tip ends up in the uh, uterine wall and it doesn't drain anymore. Usually that, that, that is, is not uncommon, but when the fetus starts moving again after the medication has worn off, it usually pulls itself free and it will start draining. And then we try always with the bilateral ones to, to keep the needle in place, to turn the baby around with the needle so we don't have to have two insertions of this thick needle. Turn the baby with the trocar and then insert the shunt in the other side. And that actually uh, always works. We, I don't think we ever had two insertions with this uh, thick needle. You can see the curve here very nicely, then it's pulled back. You have to take some care to, to leave some room for the skin because after about a week or so the skin is back to normal and that can pull uh, the, the shunt in if you leave too little of the shunt outside. And then, of course, what we hope is that the baby recovers in utero and loses all the high drops before it is born. That is really a, a very important goal. Uh, the very sick hydropic babies, uh, when they are born prematurely by often cesarean section, by uh, uh, obstetricians panicking because it looks so bad, it is really a very, very, very poor prognosis. They almost all die unless you have an extremely good neonatal care unit, these babies are a nightmare to resuscitate. If you manage to get the shunts in and they have time to recover, at least a week or so, then when the hydrops disappears, they uh, are born in, in a relatively good condition. Most are born uh, vaginally and, and doing well. You have to take care to clamp the shunt immediately with uh, 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 some forceps because it's, it's an open shunt, there's no valve inside, so you get a pneumothorax immediately when you leave it open. Um, but sometimes they, they, they block at, at birth or you can pull them out and nothing happens. Um, you know, this is, we think, the, the ideal placement in the back just uh, uh, below the scapula here. So what are the indications for this uh, procedure? Uh, as was uh, said by the previous speaker, 
The non-hydropic lung lesions have an excellent prognosis in general when they are isolated and the baby is not hydropic, even if they look very big, there is no indication for a, a prenatal intervention that goes for CCAM or CPAM as we uh, call it more often nowadays, and hydrothorax. However, if there is hydrops in utero, then the prognosis is, is very, very poor. It's almost 100% uh, uh, mortality rate in, in hydrops, and especially uh, the, the neonatal death after an emergency uh, delivery is, is very, very common in these cases. So it's really worthwhile to try and, and do some intervention to get rid of this hydrops before birth. This is, this is a, a CPAM uh, with one large cyst, which is, I think, uh, the, the easiest and the best prognosis. This is easy to put a shunt in. You only need one. Um, but this is also a good indication. It's multiple cysts. They actually do drain if you put in one, uh, one shunt in, into one of these cysts. The other one's uh, empty as well and can actually be treated. The sort of solid-looking cases, the uh, microcystic CCAMs that have not been, uh, we've not been able to, to shunt those in any way uh, successfully. It is obviously relatively rare, about one in 10,000 uh, births. And of course, there's a whole list of differential diagnoses. We prefer, of course, to select those cases that are truly isolated, but that is not so easy. I'll come back to that in the next slide. This is the disease we really go for. This is isolated chylothorax, as the neonatologists call it. This is something that goes away by itself has an excellent prognosis. If the baby survives the difficult times uh, around birth, it, it sometimes may take a month or, or a year, but uh, often the, the fluid goes away in, in, a, in a few weeks. There's a huge difference in, in the production of uh, lymphatic fluid before and after birth, so just to keep the baby alive and then the problem will go away and it can be a completely healthy child in the long run. You have the abnormalities in the uh, chromosomal uh, makeup, of course. Noonan syndrome is a difficult problem. Diagnosis more and more can be done uh, within a few weeks now, uh, genetically before birth, but uh, not all cases uh, can, be, can be easily detected and it takes some time. Diaphragmatic hernia is a differential diagnosis, especially for the multicystic uh, C-CAMs, as was discussed before. And there's a number of syndromes that uh, are not so easy to detect before birth that uh, have hydrops and uh, hydrothorax. And that is actually something that we need to warn the parents for. We can, we can try to detect uh, as much as we can, but there remains uh, a, a few percent at least of uh, syndromes and diagnoses that only become parent after birth, and then if that is a severe disease, then the parents or us or all of us may feel sorry that we kept such a, a severely uh, handicapped child alive uh, instead of letting nature take its course. But that's, that's in the counseling is an important aspect. Then another thing that I completely agree with the previous speaker that in, especially in hydropic cases it is really worthwhile to keep these babies in as long as possible. There's no use in uh, early or near term delivery. It only increases the problems after birth. So leave them inside. Let them recover from their, uh, from their hydrops. So even if our latest case was 35 weeks but even at, at 37 if you see a hydropic hydrothorax case that's apparently isolated, it is really worthwhile to, to treat. It can be uh, with a, a few uh, needle drainages as well if shunting is not easily accessible, but get this fluid out, let the baby recover in utero because it doesn't need the lungs uh, until after birth. This dilemma I just briefly mentioned before is 
in, in clinical practice, it, it happens a lot. We get these cases referred with serious high drops, uh, parents in despair, uh, referring doctors having given a very poor prognosis and almost no hope, then there is some urgency. We don't like to wait two or three weeks for a carrier type like in the past or uh, two weeks for a, a microarray. Uh, but it's possible that you have an abnormality in, in that area. The, the QF-PCR can be uh, done in, in two days or so, but uh, we have some cases of uh, 4P minus syndrome or like Noonan, this is Dr. Noonan and one of her patients. Uh, these syndromes may not be detected on time. And then when you actually shunted the case and, and sort of save the baby, then to withdraw care or, or have a late termination, that's often very difficult. So it's a dilemma that's, that's hard to solve. Fast diagnosis from the genetics department is, of course, what we like. And then a discussion we had a few years ago with some centers, uh, we had a patient that uh, was diagnosed with the trisomy 21 and had a, a hydropic hydrothorax uh, fetus and no other abnormalities, uh, uh, normal heart, everything else looked fine. And the parents really insisted that we treated this uh, trisomy 21 fetus while well, in our protocol it says isolated, uh, no chromosomal abnormalities. And it's, uh, it's something that we, we, we changed our mind. We actually treated this fetus and it's now a child with Down syndrome, but surviving and doing relatively well. We also treat Down syndrome cases we, after birth. They are operated on their AVSD or their bowel atresia, so why not treat them in utero? And a few centers in the world uh, like Toronto said, yeah, we treated a few trisomy 21, although it's usually in the guidelines and textbooks that indication is isolated. There may be some exceptions, of course, in close uh, uh, collaboration counseling with parents and, and pediatricians. Outcome, um, what to tell the parents? Uh, is there... Uh, decent literature on, on outcomes. That's difficult. Most uh, case series are relatively small, so there are a few uh, systematic reviews looking at outcome. This is one uh, that we did some years ago where we showed a, a survival. Obviously, a lot of uh, types of bias in these series, but 67% survival overall of hydropic, isolated, apparently isolated, hydrothorax cases treated with shunt is something that can be reached um, and that is uh, similar to, to what others found. Mark Kilby and colleagues uh, uh, do a lot of systematic reviews and they found a huge improvement over doing nothing. So these figures can be used in the, in the counseling. Um, this is, I, I checked yesterday, our, our series uh, up to now 38 cases with a 76% survival uh, until the 28 days after birth. Um, for the hydrothorax and the CPAM, uh, slightly less. Still, what we believe is, is an extremely important part of, of fetal therapy procedures is not to just look at survival, but to look at long-term follow-up. That is time-consuming, it's expensive. In some countries, it's totally impossible because of you know, people treated in a center and then disappearing somewhere in, in huge countries. Here in Holland we have, uh, we're very fortunate that it's, it's, it's a very small country. Um, everyone has a telephone, everyone has a family doctor, uh, everyone agrees to, to come to our center when these children are two years old, five years old. And, uh, we have a, a formal follow-up program now with a, a, a psychologist that does the Bailey scores and all the other tests appropriate for age in all the cases that we uh, treat prenatally. And then uh, we slowly gain some experience uh, also in this uh, area. Uh, hopefully next year she can publish our, our formal series of all children two years of age and older that, that survived. What I've heard from her is that there are at least 10-15% of these children 
having quite serious uh, syndromes or problems in, in behavior, neurodevelopmental abnormalities. So it is, it is not a group that, that is similar to like uh, rhesus disease without any problems. There are problems. The actual percentage, we're not sure, but I, I, will, I guess it's going to be around 15% at least and probably more and that's something parents uh, uh, should know. It's not available yet, such uh, data, so I think it's important. Um, and a last uh, thing, because there are so, so many MRI talks uh, this course, is that these shunts have a little metal tip uh, on both sides. And so if you put the fetuses in an MRI, after uh, shunting, you get all these funny artifacts and you can make nothing out of it. So if you have shunted the case, don't put them in the MRI. Uh, just one last remark on the pulmonary sequestration. They often have uh, hydrothorax as well. We think they can be treated uh, with laser of the, of the vessel and but just one time draining with the same needle of the hydrothorax because if you treat the cause, the hydrops or the Hydrothorax shouldn't come back. So these are not cases that we should uh, shunt, we think. And I saw in the bookstore uh, outside here that uh, you can buy this very nice book. If you want to know more about fetal therapy, uh, that would be a nice uh, gift for, for uh, Easter or Christmas or <laughs> something. Okay, thank you very much. Well, did you say you had no conflicts to declare? <laughs> <laughs> Very nice uh, presentation. Are there questions for the cookers? Well, I got a question. I saw that uh, the um, outcome of uh, fetus is with CPAM, where you did a thoracos, uh, well, uh, let's say, where you put a shunt, are much worse than uh, those with the uh, hydrothorax. Uh, how do you explain that? Um, the, the, I think it was 57% survival so far. Yes, uh, of as opposed it, it, to 75. Yes, yes, you would yeah. expect a, a bit more, that's true. Mm. It's uh, not sure it reaches statistical significance. I think it's the, the lower numbers and especially what, what is important is, is uh, timely referral. And I think the cases that we have seen, especially in the first years, were really very, very sick babies that, that uh, didn't make it uh, uh, despite the shunt or with or without the shunt. And I think with, the, later, with, with the earlier referral and still in not too bad shape uh, in terms of cardiac function, I think that's very important. But it might still be, be coincidence and not, not a real danger to, yeah. Okay, thank you. Different. There is another question there. Good morning, Mr. Ramakas from Belgium. Um, if you see a really large CPAM or a large isolated hydrothorax, do you really wait putting in a shunt till you see the high drops? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> There's one, one exception, I think, like there's always an exception. Uh, if you um, plan a, a delivery of such cases, it would be a very uh, useful intervention to just before or during the delivery to have a one-time needle drainage of the fluid. That really makes the life of the neonatologist a lot easier. And actually, when we put in a, a needle in a, a fetus like this, or even a shunt, it's under ultrasound guidance. It's a fetus is surrounded by fluid. It is, you can see very well what you're doing. And I don't know if you have ever seen a neonatologist put in a thorax shunt that is done blindly. They stick it in, uh, just probing around a bit. Uh, that, that looks terrible to me. It's, I think it's much better to do this just a few hours before the baby's still in the womb and you can see exactly what you're doing. Okay, I suppose that was it. Thank you Thank very you much. Again.